Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. As the drive hits the deep right field, that ball is going, going, it is gone. Maris hitting his second homer of the day. And the Yankees. And it's Savage. Savage, Savage, Savage hitting his homers today. It's July 13th, 2015. And if you think I'm going to throw my summer in the toilet, you're mistaken. If you think I'm going to get wrapped up in the illegal alien problem, if you think I'm going to get wrapped up in the Donald Trump problem, the Scott Walker problem, you're right. But I'm not going to do it to the exclusion of everything else. Why should I throw my summer in the garbage? Let me explain something to you. Most people in the conservative media think that they're making an impact. They're not. They're talking to their own audience. There's been no growth in the audience of the conservative base. You're my base. I get it. But there's been no growth in the conservative base. It's, base. it's been shrinking. Do you know why? Because the only issue that matters to the average man is the pebble in the shoe. That's the guy around you. They don't give a damn about Obama. They don't care about him. They don't care what he's doing. They don't care how he's doing it. You know what they care about? whether they have some money in their pocket, whether their credit cards work, that de Blasio, the commie, is turning New York back to the age of Dinkins. It's not affecting them. All the average man wants in the July of the year is having a good time, putting some food in his mouth, having a drink. If he's married, raising his kids. And that's about it. He doesn't eat his heart out over what's coming in the year 2016. You think he's wrapped up in the whole Trump thing? And speaking about Trump, by the way, here's the question of the day. And it's a tough one. Is Trump a Democrat plant or does he really mean it? A lot of people are asking that. Some really smart people are asking that question. I myself am not sure. I asked him when he was on the show, are you really going to split the ticket? Are you going to pull a uh, Ross Perot? Are you going to run a third party? Remember, he hesitated for about 40 seconds and he wouldn't answer. And I let the line go out on the Marlin. I let it run out. I heard it going out. I heard the reel spinning. And then he came back in and the line snapped and he said, no, I'm a Republican. I'm a lifetime Republican. I'm, I'm going to run as a Republican. But then last week, he opened it up to a third party possibility, right? So we don't know what to think. We know that if he runs on a third party ticket, it's a guaranteed slam dunk for the anointed one, another Clinton. We will have the Arkansas gang running America again. That's all. Eight years of Bush, eight years of Clinton. Let's see, uh, eight years of Obama. Uh, I think it's a Republican's turn. My suspicion is that the Bilderbergs are going to pick Jeb Bush. That's what I think. About the worst possible president in American history. You talk about trickle-up poverty and trickle-down tyranny. Okay, whatever. Now, let's get down to business. It's summertime. It's July. People don't listen to this show for the same reasons that they listen to other talk shows, some of which are excellent, some of which are mediocre, and some are downright boring and terrible. They listen to this show for something else. They want not only my politics, but they want current events. They want lifestyle issues. They want my humor, they want my sincerity, they want my intimacy. You hear what I'm saying to you? But of course you want to hear what's going on in America. And you also want to hear what I think about this one and that one. And I get that. And I understand that the feeding frenzy against Donald Trump shows us the danger we are really in. When you have a psychopath, such as The View co-host Raven Simone, I don't know what that is, if it's a disease or a person. I don't know whether it's the raven Simone syndrome, which is some kind of bodily ailment, a mental disorder, but some illness called raven Simone on a show called The View, when I looked at it a few times, it looks like rotten fruit on the jungle floor, the whole pack of them, actually said that Donald Trump killed Catherine Steinle in San Francisco. Can you believe this? Then you've got the psycho in the White House, 
that no matter what is going on, it's not good enough for the psycho Marxist from you know where. And as I said to you last week, he wants to repeat the disaster of the 60s where they bust children from minority neighborhoods into middle-class white neighborhoods, which was a disaster for all. He now wants to basically bus minorities into white, white suburbs, which was my headline last week. You cannot believe the, de the demonic nature of this guy in the White House. No matter what he has, no matter what he has, no matter what he gets, no matter how far left he pushes the nation, no matter how racially insensitive he is, it's not enough for him. And so he pushes this thing of, quote, racially integrating neighborhoods. What does that actually mean? How is that actually going to work? Well, I'll tell you this. We'll talk about it because it's an amazing fact where he says in clip 30, uh, let's start with clip, when I say clip, soundbite 30. Go with 30, Robert. Let the audience join me on this. We're using data on housing and neighborhood conditions to help cities identify the areas that need the most help. help. We're doing more to help communities meet their help. own goals. Goal. Plus, by opening up this data to everybody, everyone data. in the community, not just elected officials, can weigh in. Frank if you want a bus stop added near your home or more affordable housing nearby, now you'll have the data you need to make your case. Next, 31. You'll hear the These actions thing. won't make every community perfect. That's perfect. something we all have to strive for in our own lives. Are you but crazy? But will help make our community stronger and more vibrant. How? They'll help keep this a country where kids from every background can grow up knowing are you crazy? that no matter who you are, what you look like, or where you live, you can write your own story. Now, look, there are so many things I could say right now that are sickening that I won't say them. The man is a maniac. He's a left-wing fanatic. And what is he actually trying to achieve here? These actions won't make every community perfect? Do you understand how psychotic that is? Do you understand that when a president says he wants to make something perfect, he's a sick man? This is, a, this is an ill man. I mean, we have a mentally ill person in the White House. But what good does it... See, I started this show by telling you you don't care about that. Now I'm telling you you should care about that. So the answer is, what should you think? What can you think in a July of 2015? I don't know. Think what you want to think. What do you really think is going on with Donald Trump? Is he for real? Then why does the left hate him so much? Why does America, uh, Mexico's number one drug kingpin hate him so much? I mean, we know he's right. And I'll tell you, I can prove he's right. Let me explain why I know Donald Trump is right. Take a look at the entire Republican field. Bush, the ice cream man cometh, or shall I say the ice cream man goeth, Rubio. What's the other one? Cruz, Celia Cruz's grandson, David Cruz. I, I can't remember him, sorry. I, I like his policies. I know he was at Harvard. I had a never, he's never going to make it. Darling of the Tea Party, I love his politics. He's not, he's not getting near the White House. He can't, he's not getting out of the starting gate. number of reasons I'll give you in a while. Cruz, uh, who else is out there? Walker now jumped in. Mr. Every, every Man is, is in there. Is there a couple? Oh, Lindsey Graham, the double-talking, two-faced. You know what? Am I missing anyone? I'm going to ask you a question. Of all of these potential candidates for Republican president, who could actually fill in on the Savage Nation as a talk show host and succeed in keeping your attention for more than 30 seconds? Donald Trump. That's why I know he really could be a, a president. You know that Jeb Bush couldn't fill in. He wouldn't know what to say after about 13 seconds without a teleprompter. It'd be over. Cruz, what would he say for, for more than three minutes? He'd read the Constitution. What would Rubio talk about? The need for, for immigration reform? So I don't think any of them could, could garner an audience for any length of time other than Donald Trump. He gave a great speech over the weekend. But the issue is, I mean, is he really running for sure? I don't know what it's all about. I know that he's getting the uh, left wing insane because he's saying everything that the average American thinks, and they're not used to it. They're just not used to it. They're not used to it. When he gave a speech in Phoenix, a bunch of illegal alien thug criminals showed up and tried to shout him down. They sh the crowd shouted them and marched him out, bum marched him out. The Hispanic radicals put in there like by La Raza and SEIU never saw anything like this in their lives. They thought that they would ca bend down to them and, and ask them how they felt and why they felt that way. They threw him out on their behinds. Get out of the audience here. You don't belong. They threw him out. 
They threw them out, those troublemakers. They wanted to start a riot in there. But the people in attendance didn't go for the bait. They left. They left with their tails between their legs. And the fact of the matter is, it was the first time that the Hispanic lobby had their butts kicked in the United States of America since Obama's in power. Never has any group stood up to the Hispanic lobby like they did at the Trump rally in Phoenix, by the way. Very, very important that you should know that. America is under attack, especially Caucasian America. I know you don't want to hear that. There is a war against white males. It's been going on a very long time. It didn't start with Obama. You have to look at who took over the school system a long time ago. You have to look at what they've done to your boy by drugging him. It started with medication, false diagnoses, you know, ADD, ADHD, LSMFT, whatever the child. As I wrote it in the 1980s in a book of mine called uh, Healing Children Naturally, I said that if Tom Sawyer were alive today, one of the crackpot doctors would declare he had ADD and put him on medication, and he never would have gone on to the river with Huck Finn. There would be no Huck Finn. There would be no Tom Sawyer. Which leads me back around to a few other things, including the fact that it's summertime and the living is supposed to be easy, by the way. It's very nice. I mean, it's summertime. I'm sitting here drinking my coffee with cardamom and cinnamon in it, Arab style, little spices, second cup of the day. I've been bicycling more. Oh, yeah, even I took a 10-miler on Saturday or Sunday. I used to do that years ago. I had my soul saved last week by three rabbis. And that triggered my desire to save my body. So I went back to bicycling. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting thing, what I'm going through personally. My energy has come back. The uh, interest that I've had in, I want to put it in a way that, you know, is palatable to the general audience, to things beyond what appeared to be going on. That world has always intrigued me, okay? the As I wrote when I was an 18-year-old biology student, in an anatomy class, I said, I'm more interested in the glint in the animal's eye than I am in the animal's anatomy. So the anatomy professor said that I was too dreamy to be an anatomist. I said, you're right, I'm too dreamy to be an anatomist. So when the animal was laying there, I wanted to know where the glint went. Where was the glint in the eye? Where did it come from? Where did it go? I've always been interested in the glint in the eye. You get it? So you, my audience, are an invisible force. I never see you. I don't know who you are. And all I know of you is the glint coming at me from your words. You are the glint out there. And before I take my first commercial break on this Monday on the Savage Nation, the radio and television business report came out today from David Saylor. And it's got a very important message for those of you who don't know who is the king of radio. And it says the savage stream prevails again. Here's what they wrote, not what I wrote. It says, when it comes to accessing spoken word audio content via streaming, the fans of Michael Savage are by far the largest in that particular universe. The identity of the number two talker bears witness to the enormity of Savage's feet. The number two talker is Rush Limbaugh. Savage's latest TSL rating from TalkStreamLive.com is nearly double that of Limbaugh. The enormity of Savage's feet is amplified when we add in the fact that Limbaugh's score is more than double that of number three Laura Ingram. TalkStream Live said that Savage's number 25 score is unprecedented. And they give the results from uh, April 1 through June 30th. Savage has a 25 share, Limbo 12 share, Ingram 6 share, an unknown man at number 4, Glenn Beck at number 5, Hannity at number 6, etc. There are some very good talkers down there, but the numbers don't lie. So you say, eh, they don't really matter. It's some crackpot little organization, TalkStream Live. All right, say what you want. So here's what people wrote in the commentary. John says, it's such a great show, it's better than a politics show. It's a great conversation, a good company that happens to include politics and current events among such a rich medley of other topics. Warm, sincere, intimate, and funny to be blessed, Dr. Savage. Now, this man has it right. If you went to college, you studied something called set and frame. Set and frame. It's a psychological term. What's the set and what's the frame? This show is more than, it's better than a politics show. You hear me? It includes politics, but it has other things in it. In other words, it's not politics plus. It's the plus including politics. Set and frame. I'll be back.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. Can you hear me now? It's summertime, and I'm not going to let Obama steal my summer. And, you know, we'll do politics. How, how excited can you get about the election in 2016 now? How? How much can you take of this garbage? Is everything in life political? Well, the answer is yes. But isn't there anything else in life? I mean, don't you grill on the weekend? You don't grill something? You don't take a hike, a walk, a bike ride, a swim? You don't make love? I mean, is there nothing else in life except politics? I don't know anymore. There has to be more in life. Oh, I got to tell you a story. A minute now left. I, I can't develop. I don't know. Maybe the format's not right for me. I need like an hour to develop an idea. I got five, 19 seconds now. I'll, I'll do the best I can. I go in the supermarket yesterday, middle of the day. There's a black guy in front of me like a, a Hercules and Adonis. Like six foot five, muscles on the muscles. I'm talking mountain man. Nice guy. I have my little dog Teddy with me. I'm checking out. And the lady friend is with him. She turns and she says, whatever, I don't know. Let's say his name is Bobby. She says, Bobby, that's the kind of dog you need. So we started talking about dogs. Friendly guy, and he's talking loud like I talk loud when I'm around people who can talk rather than the mutes of Marin County, the muted men of Marin County who lost their voice at birth. And if you talk too loud around them, they, I, I think they need to pop a pill. So he and I start talking, and on the way out, one word leads to another. And it's his joke, not mine. There's like a fruit stand outside the market. He tells a joke about watermelons, even though he's black. And he says like a joke to everyone. He says, I think I'll take those watermelons outside because they look like they're free and I need one. And I, I started to laugh hysterically. I mean, I understood what he was doing. He was playing a game with all the white people around them. And he was doing a double on them. So I started to joke with the guy. We became instantly into a rapport. It turns out he's from Cleveland. See, anyone who's like east of the Mississippi can talk. Anyone west of the Mississippi is tongue-tied, by and large. Anyway, I'll tell you more about the conversation in a minute. I, I, I need an hour now to talk about that. Before I come back, I'll forget what I was talking about. I'll have to go on to another topic, like the death of the white male. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. All you old guys in Fort Lauderdale, what would you give to be 15 again with a pack of cigarettes rolled up in your undershirt above your deltoids as you hobble around on a boardwalk chasing the rainbow of your past? And what a country this would have been if Frankie Lyman became president instead of Barack Obama. He went, in the wrong, he went into the wrong field. I mean, he would have brought people together. Any rock and roll singer of the 50s would have made a better president than Obama. This radical nut, no matter what he gets, he wants more. Supreme Court victories. Now, integrate neighborhoods now. Bust neighborhoods up. Bust people in to commit crime. Are you crazy? There's no end to this guy. Is, not, is anything enough for him? No. No. It's the mark of insanity. So that's why I can't do I just can't keep doing it. So where was I? I was in the supermarket. See, I have so many stories bursting to come out of my head through my vocal uh, cords to you. And I'm going to try to get them. So the, I'm in the market. There's this guy who looks like Adonis, the black guy we talk. He jokes about the watermelon. I start to laugh hysterically. I tell him a bagel joke. He cracks up. So he's with two women, a black woman and a white woman. And we're outside. We're talking. And I said, do you work, you work out in the gym? He says, no, I own my own gym. So I said, that's interesting. I said, you know... I said, I used to really be in great shape when I was a kid. I was going to a gym when I was 15, the American Health Studios on Jamaica Avenue. Religiously, I went there after high school. And I'd pump iron, and I was getting strong in my biceps, triceps, hiceps, myceps, your sips, her sips, his sips. I mean, they were all, all the sips were good. They were all good. And I would pump myself up and do push-ups in the living room, and my dad would be proud of me for the first time in my life because I could finally knock him out if I wanted to, but I didn't. He finally got afraid of me when he saw the muscles after bullying me my whole life and putting me down. So finally figured he'd make me his friend. <laughs> anyway, I would go to the gym, good shape. Then I stopped it. You know, at around 40, I don't know what happened. I just it wasn't into it. You become like flabby. If you're going to die anyway, what's the difference? We're going to die a good corpse. Then I remember joking when I was 50 
that, uh, who was it? Mark Twain said the funniest thing in the world about exercise. When they said to Mr. Twain, uh, <clears throat> do you get exercise? He says, yes. I get all of my exercise walking to, I'm sorry, walking to the funerals of my more athletic friends, which I thought was hilarious, Robert. That is still funny, right? Mark Twain, which is very funny. You know, the famous death of the runner, Jim Sticks. I wrote for Runner's Magazine. You don't know that back in the 70s when I was totally into the health food thing. Macrobiotic diet, vitamin writer. I was in great shape. I mean, I weighed 130 pounds. I looked like, a, I would say, a Somali beekeeper. That's the shape I was in. Almost died of insanity from a lack of fat in my blood. I was near crazed all the time in hung, out of hunger. Because I grew up eating awesomely bad meals. I don't want to go through the childhood diet, the savage childhood diet, because if you were to design in a concentration camp, or let's say a prison camp, not to be overly... Uh, if you were to design a, a, a diet to see how fast you could kill someone by giving them atherosclerosis, it would have been my diet, the savage diet, what I was force-fed like a goose, didn't kill me. And I had secondhand smoke, by the way. To this day, I can remember the secondhand smoke of the Philip Morris in my father's lap. Didn't kill me. What a bunch of crap. And one other thing, by the way, secondhand smoke. There's a, here's another one for you. I grew up in the apartment in the Bronx, right? Lead, they said oh, inner city children are exposed to pollutants at a higher rate. Yeah, right, another shakedown. I lived in an inner city, and I grew up before anyone knew about the dangers of lead. And lead-based paint was the norm. And to this day, I can remember we would, my cousin was in the adjacent apartment. And sometimes we would get out of hand, and our parents would separate us. We weren't allowed to get together. So we deviously took screwdrivers like prisoners. And in the wee dark corners of the doorway, the door jams, which joined in a common wall, <clears throat> we cut the wall out. I swear to God, both sides. We were like prisoners, like Guzman. We created an escape route. I dug like through the wall, through the paint. You could see the the laughing behind the uh, the plaster, and I could just see my cousin's eye peering through from his side of the apart other apartment. And we would communicate there like like prisoners. But the point is, is that we'd have to put our mouths on the lead paint. I could smell the lime to this day. I can remember it. Are you kidding me? My mouth was on that lead based paint day in and day out, talking to my cousin through the apartment. It didn't do anything to me. I mean, what are you talking about? It's all a matter of how much, you know, what dosage, and how often you get it. I know most of this is falling on deaf ears. I get it. Daddy, no one wants to hear that. They want to hear. They want to hear the, all right, Mike, stick to the politics. I get it. We like the childhood story. Stick to the politics. Get back to work. Democrat bad, Republican good. Republican no good. Democrat no good. Trump good. You're good. I'm good. He's good. Okay, I get it. I'm not doing it right now. Not yet, not ready. Monday, it's summertime. So I'm saying all this other stuff, you know. Oh, just got this from my publisher, executive editor of St. Martin's Press. Despite the blackout by the New York Times, where I beat three other books and they wouldn't list it, the book has sold about 40,000 or more copies. They're ecstatic with no promotion. Nobody gave me the, the, anything. This is only a novel, Countdown to Mecca. My third novel in the series, I'm shocked that it sold that many. I figured 28,000 hardcover, about another 30 from about 40,000, yeah, with the ebooks. Because people have heard about it and they're reading it. That's good. Maybe once in my life something will take off without any promotion. Maybe something. How do people sell books without, a, without any, any promotion at all? It happens. People do, you know, catch on. All right, let's move on here on the Savage Nation. 855 cleaned up a little business here. 855 407 282 is the phone number. So, okay, so Friday I took a bike ride after the show. I decided to change my life for the better. Got the bike. Instead of just bicycling around my house, which is so boring, I want to fall off and have a concussion. It's gotten so boring. Where I know every, every crack in the pavement. So I, I truck the bike over. I'm an old uh, Rover, Range Rover that I keep in a garage. I put the bike in the back of the Rover to get out of the neighborhood, and I took it over to uh, Sausalito. Uh, this beautiful town, beautiful little town. And I bicycled around there. And I went to an office that I keep down there in uh, the area, and I found some of my old pamphlets when I first started in radio. And I found something that I wrote before I was in radio, copyrighted 1991, before you ever heard of me. When I was unknown to the world, I was well known in the health food business as a writer. I was a fa fantastic educator in the field of alternative medicine. 
I wrote a small pamphlet called The Death of the White Male. Copyright 1991. Quantum Books. Republished, recopyrighted 2003. And it's on the one political science, affirmative action to contemporary social issues. And um, I'm going to read it to you. I have time right now. I can do it. And it's called The Death of the White Male. And I wrote it after I was shafted by the communists in the ACLU who told me that as a white male, even though I had a straight A average, I wasn't entitled to get a professorship in any way. They were hiring only minorities and women, illegal aliens. This was in 1977. I remember writing this in the Sierra Nevada mountains in November because I always took my angst out in my writing and in other ways. So I'll read it to you. You ready for it? Robert, do you want to hear this? Do they want to hear it? I want my audience to tell me they want to hear the death of the white male. Not Trump, not hump, not mump, not pumps, not mumps, nothing. I don't care about the missing pumps from Judy Garland. I don't care about Donald Trump. I don't care about the hump of Mount Baldy. I care about this. Do you want me to read it or not? Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway because I'm in the mood. So I wrote this when I was kind of young and angry. So I don't know if it's still me. Here's, here it is. Called The Death of the White Male. Are you ready? You clean the wax out of your ears. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Mr. Obama, are you ready? Are you all ready out there? Here it goes. White male professors and legalistic hypocrites declaring an end to injustices call for the death of their kind, excluding themselves to make up for generations of sad injustices. We declare the hiring by racial quota a just service. After all, their jobs are made for life. So why not give it the expense of those approved by excellence? The noose of unemployment at the end of the long, dark tunnel of trial. But why not give our fashionable minorities the jobs of those atop? They who cry for justice. Let the braying sheep throw their own skins to the stalking hungry giving all an equal opportunity. I am an equal opportunity employee, the son of Benjamin, a small shopkeeper, the grandson of Samuel, a serf. Did I enslave the Hispanics or did they do the enslaving here in the Americas? Have you forgotten history, my dear white male friends? Are Cortez and De Soto mere automobile insignias? Native American Indians of the Southern Hemisphere shot from cannons? Not by my ancestors, how about yours? The ears of forest-dwelling children of God cut off in Russia by axe-wielding peasants with potato faces, natives of the Amazon similarly maimed by Portuguese adventurers. I am the smallest minority in America, an individual man who aligns himself with no group, calls himself by no race, but strives always for excellence. I am an equal opportunity employee, and I stand behind no false systems, braying for a chance in mass production. America. We make machines which break too readily, all subject to recall. Applying the same system to humans, to people, we are instructed to desire mass-produced equality based on a certain number of colors evenly arranged on totalitarian charts in Washington, at every state capital, in every mayor's office, in every school, at every job site. A nice orderly arrangement of colors like so many poppy red refrigerators and so many white ones and so many black ones and so many brown ones. We demand the production of equality. Our sense of assembly line consciousness demands such even handedness at the expense of quality. <laughs> listen, my fringing, listen, my screaming friends of La Raza and you who no longer have the right to cop to your grandfather's serfdom because you got the same access to tools that I have. Listen, friends. Here's a little secret for you. Without quality, there is no equality. In the world of man, when someone goes up, another goes down. By being shut out, and if there are only a certain number of slots created by the boys who run the ship, then take your chances alongside me without declaring yourself the oppressed. Yes, I appeal to your manliness, to your sense of pride, because what you get too easily, you won't enjoy. You'll distrust yourself forever, always knowing that far more worthy souls were forever locked out in exile by their oppressors, those ruling professional mouths who lose nothing by employing you. I am an equal opportunity employee, the smallest minority in America, and your little game of color shuffle looks awfully white to me. November 1977, Sarah Nevada Mountain by Michael Savage.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Live in the sun for a thousand years and drink Uzo. This is considered fast. I turn it on. I can't take it. It's a different culture. They got what they want. They shook down uh, Europe. They got bailed out. Uh, the pensions haven't gone down one, one, uh, one euro a year. That's all. Uh, 15 weeks vacation, fake disability. Sit there and knock off the, the black olives. Sit in the sun and complain about the Germans. That's all. What could be better? That's all. What do you need money for in Greece? You got the sun. You got the olives. You got the baklava. And you got the Germans and the French to support you. What more do you need? I happen to like the Greek people. The two I ever met in my whole life. There was a guy named Gus who told me a when my car broke down once in, in Queens. He was the only Greek I ever knew till now. I mean, and he was a nice guy. I don't really know. I say Greece. I don't know Greek people. My car broke down in Queens by a, by a cemetery. When I got there, like in 1985, I shipped the car over. The clutch went. I ran up to a gas station, Gus's gas station. Nicest guy in the world. He towed my car like all the way to Long Island <laughs> to a house with me sitting in the tow truck with my son. I arrived at my new house in the tow truck. Nice guy, the Greek guy. I was going to invite him in for food. We had nothing in the house. Then I didn't meet another Greek until I went to a, a, a Bavarian festival, a beer festival a couple of years ago. A nice Greek guy came up and he said, I love your show, but why do you put the Greeks down? I said, I don't put Greeks down. I said, they're lazy. They're a basket case. They're the basket case of Europe. Okay, I didn't say any more than that. It's What's going on with Greece? Why do they think that they're entitled to live the way, let's say, the Germans live, who are very industrious and productive, and export something? I mean, the Germans make wonderful products. The Mercedes, you all know the Mercedes. You heard of that, right? It's the car that most people on welfare drive. I'm joking. <laughs> Germans are productive, industrious people. They make beautiful things. They're an advanced economy, advanced society, advanced technology. And unfortunately, the Greeks, I don't know what happened. They never kept up. They're living on their Parthenon for the last couple of thousand years. How long can you say Plato wrote the Republic and therefore I'm proud? So they're, they're like, uh, they don't have the money to support themselves. Very much like Detroit. Very much like every city in America with illegal aliens. Do you think these cities are solvent? Do you think so? 276 sanctuary cities in America. You're telling me they're solvent when they don't collect taxes from these illegal aliens? They let 8,145 illegal offenders free in just eight months, according to this article on Drudge. 17,000 total. San Francisco has released rapists and murderers. Fact. Make a panada out of that instead of a panada of Trump who's telling the truth. Thousands of criminal immigrants were set free Set free, set free on the streets by so-called sanctuary cities last year. Each one is a ticking time bomb. Rapists, murderers, you name it. They were let free. 63% of the individuals freed by local authorities had prior criminal histories or were labeled a public safety concern at the time of their release, according to CIS, which obtained the data from ICE through a public records request. Did you hear this? 1,900 of the released offenders were arrested for another crime within that eight-month period. So that's why Catherine Steinle was shot while walking with her father. Don't blame Trump. Blame the mayor. Blame the sheriff. Blame Obama. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Are we 
have breaking news coming out of Boston on the Savage Nation. Hold on to your seats. The son of a Boston police captain allegedly involved in a terror plot to do with ISIS. Now, here's the question of the day. The son of a Boston police captain was an ISIS supporter who planned to set off an improvised explosive device and was arrested after illegally purchasing four firearms on July 4, according to a Justice Department press release in My Fox Boston. So here's a question to my audience. Son of a Boston police captain. Tell me in your heart of hearts who you think the police captain is racially. Immediately you said, oh, he must have been a Muslim police captain. Then you erased that and said, oh, he must have been a black Muslim, a convert, the father. You're wrong. Authorities say 23-year-old Alexander Ciccolo, Alexander Ciccolo, which would indicate he's Italian-American. It shows you how far this insanity is spreading. Can you imagine the Italian son of an Italian police captain in Boston now? who went by the name of Ali Al-Amriki and posted about martyrdom on Facebook, said it about, spoke about setting off an explosive device in places where large numbers of people congregate, such as college cafeterias. He was seen buying a pressure cooker. Now, here's the, here's the heartbreaker. Chicolo's father reported his son to the FBI after noticing suspicious behavior, according to my Fox Boston. Could you believe this? What heartbreak this is for the father? Chicolo first planned to attack members of the military and law enforcement personnel, according to conversations he had with a confidential informant, as related in DOJ documents. Later, he expressed a desire to attack an unidentified university in another state, with the attack broadcast live online. Anyway, we win or we die, he is quoted as saying in a detention memo. The FBI arrested Chicolo after he took possession of the guns, which are given to him by the confidential informant, Chicolo was previously arrested for an alcohol-related crime and was ineligible to buy the firearms. A subsequent search of Chicolo's apartment turned up partially constructed Molotov cocktails, two machetes, and a large knife. You hear this nut? After his arrest, authorities allege Chicolo stabbed a nurse in the head with a pen during a medical exam, leaving a bloody hole in the nurse's skin and causing the pen to break in half. Shall I read further? What more do I have to read to you? This poison of ISIS is spreading like the cancer it is into the minds of the weak, the deranged, and the hateful. That's all. Move on. Nothing to see here. Well, you know, you look at your heart of hearts, say, cop's son an ISIS fan, Boston police captain's kid allegedly part of terror plot. Well, the first thing you thought was, oh, he's got to be a uh, father was a Muslim put in there. No, he wasn't. The next thing is must have been a black Muslim, the father. No, it wasn't. Irish, no, it's Italian from Boston. Go figure that one out. So where does this end? Is it a wonder people want to escape into fantasy? Like, I myself am a big television watcher. I, I don't hide that. I love television. Last night, Sunday night is great. So on my show, I, I do a segment called News, Views, and Reviews. I gave you the news already last hour and this hour. I gave you some views. Now I'm going to give you some reviews. Last night was uh, the sin qua non of television. It was almost the television world series of greatness. I had True Detective at 6 o'clock, and then I had Ray Donovan at 9. Ra ran out to dinner. and be <laughs> I, I woke up happy. I was thrilled to have such good TV. I mean, I got good TV last night. I slept better than I have no matter what I get. It's better than you know what. I couldn't believe it. Now, True Detective is on Showtime, I think. The, the shootout scene at the end of True Detective between the police and a Mexican drug cartel in Los Angeles is one of the, I would say it's the greatest uh, shootout scene in the history of, the, of cinema. The best, including movies. I've never seen anything as well done because it comes on you slowly. The cops go there with handguns because the tax squad is not available, so they don't have the automatic weapons. And there's around 10 of them, right? And the, the captain says, are you sure you want to go there without the tax squad so you know what's coming? And then the leader is a woman, and she says, yeah, we, it's very important to bring in this cartel member this bald Mexican guy. So they go to a factory area in L.A. And all of a sudden, out of a second-story window, a Mexican opens up with a heavy machine gun. I mean a heavy. Like a, we're talking military-grade, I don't know what the caliber was, just wasting the cops in the cars, bullets flying through the cars. And the cops are having to fight these Mexican cartel members who have machine guns with handguns. 
which shows you how lopsided the cops have it here in this country. See, I think all cops should have a machine gun, personally. That's my opinion. Instead of disarming, I would upgrade the arms of all police in America. So anyway, number one, true detective, make sure you catch it. The shootout scene is the best I've ever seen in the history of television and film. Let's see what else. Uh, number two, Ray Donovan. Let me begin with this. I am not a big fan of Lee Schreiber. I don't know why. He doesn't strike me as a tough guy. I don't go for guys who act tough in movies. They're usually weaklings in real life. It's an act. But, you know, the tougher they try to be, the weaker they look. And Lee Schreiber has always struck me as a very sensitive artist. They pumped him up as a leading man, and I think he actually weakens the whole series. That's the strangest part. Of, no one's ever said that. Ray Donovan's a huge hit, but I think he's the weakest part of it. I love Midnight Cowboy, and his name I always forget. I can't remember it. I had breakfast with him twice. Who's Midnight Cowboy? Raise your, Robert, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, Voight, Voight. John Voight, whatever scene John Voight is in, he steals the scene. The minute he walks on the set, all the light goes into him. You know what I'm saying? He's got such charisma. Then the, the, the Ray Donovan was excellent. Don't get me wrong. I'm building up to, I'm giving it an A despite Leif Schreiber. The false machismo of Leif Schreiber killed it. For example, in one of the opening scenes, he goes to a bar, he's depressed, and this, and he's sitting in a bar, and he's having a drink, and there's a woman yakking away with a friend about her ex, and she's going to go back with him and never going to go back with him never again, and their eyes cross. The next scene, he's, let's see, I'm talking on the radio now. I'm not in a bar. I have to adjust my language now. In the next scene, he's, wait, in the next scene, he's, well, you get the picture. In the next scene, it's like against the wall. Come on, no one, that's insanity. That's not the way people make love. Only people who don't make love create scenes like that in movies. This is a part of the Mushroom Boys of Hollywood. This is their idea of heterosexual sex. It is almost breaking a woman's head against the wall. That's their idea of lovemaking. Well, maybe that's how it's done amongst the Mushroom Boys, but it's not the way men and women make love. But nevertheless, aside from that scene, it got better. I mean, it's like the yuck factor was so high because, hey, it's, it's nonsense. It's bad porno. Nah, and the rest of it was pretty good. The Ray Donovan was very good after that. Great acting. I love the guy who died. I always forget his name as well. The guy who plays the old Jewish guy who's got semi-Alzheimer's. Does anyone know his name? Raise your hand if you know who I'm talking about. He was married to Barbara Streisand for five minutes. He plays the old, yeah, I forget his name, whatever. Dies in this one. They got rid of him. Maybe his agent demanded too much money, so they wrote him out of the play. He's good. The burial was good at the Jewish cemetery. Well done. The last scene with the wife, Ray Donovan's uh, wife, who had had the affair with the cop in the previous and the and then apologized when she got caught, but he don't want to be with her because he doesn't forgive her, even though he was a dog. He was with everything with a pulse for his whole life. She had one affair to get even with a cop, and now he's the righteous one and won't talk to her. I love that one. Now, he's suddenly on a high horse. Uh, in the last scene, I forget she's an Irish lady, excellent actress, fantastic, with a heavy Irish accent, a Boston accent, speaking of Boston. And uh, she sees a runaway dog running up a freeway on-ramp in the last scene, and she runs out of her car. It's a big dog, too. It's not her dog. And she grabs it. The last scene is her laying in her bed alone with the, with the rescue dog on her lap in the bed. It's so well done. Oh, and then there's the British actor who plays the billionaire whose son gets kidnapped, who uh, Donovan is hired to, to, to uh, save, you know. He's a great actor, Ian McShane, I think. He played a villain in uh, Sexy Beast in the year 2000. He was chilling as the villain. Incredible acting. I knew I recognized those eyes. He has like weird eyes. Ian McShane, I think. Fabulous actor. I love the house in L.A., the billionaire's house, the, the staff, the this, the that. All in all, it's a good L.A. thing. And one of the best parts, going back to True Detective, am I talking to anyone out there? Does anyone like what I'm doing or what? It has to be illegal aliens three hours a day? I'm not doing that. I told you already. You got, the, you got your red meat. You got your red meat. I threw you a, 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 a burger, a small burger today. You got a tiny burger today, a one-ouncer. That's all you're getting out of me with red meat. You got a one-ouncer red meat, and I'm going on now doing a talk show. True Detective, going back to it for a minute, the cinematography is the best I've ever seen in television because after every scene, 
they punctuate it with an aerial shot of L.A. highways and the traffic moving on it as if to say, this is what's going on in God's little world. You know what I'm saying? Behind the all the cars moving, all the freeways in L.A., and then zoom in on a house, and that's what's going on in the house. So beautiful. It just shows you. You know what I'm saying? You get that? That cosmic thing? It's like using Google Earth on your own house. Did you ever do that and almost faint? Remember when Google Earth first came out, I would like zoom into my house from heaven, and then I'd faint and say, my God, wait a minute. This is how small I really am. That's impossible. Now, why do I think I'm so big? Why do I have such an inflated sense of ego? Look at myself on Google Earth. You can't even find the city on Google Earth, let alone the person. And it just shows you how insignificant we really are. But yeah, we don't believe that. I mean, we know we are insignificant, but we can't function if, we're, if we think we're insignificant. So to compensate for the fact that we're no more significant than a, a random uh, dental filling flying <laughs> in the universe, we overcompensate by making ourselves more important than we really are. No, that's the truth. That's the absolute horrible truth of the reality of it. We are ultimately, that's what religion teaches us. We're nothing. Be humble, man, because you're nothing. Well, are we really nothing? Now I'm going to get philosophical, theosophical, my sophical, your sophical, monocle, his monocle, your monocle, my monocle. I don't know. I mean, I can't believe we're nothing. I don't believe we're the same as a strand of DNA inside an amoeba's behind. I'm sorry. I, I just don't accept that. And I understand that all animals have a similarity in a life force, and I get it. And I also understand my father taught me this when I was five. Nothing wants to die. I get that. The merest bug doesn't want to die. It'll run away from your foot. And so, I mean, what, what living thing wants to die other than people in Oregon? I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It is the Savage Nation. It's 24 minutes after the hour. It's summertime. Lighten up. We have a bug job in the White House who's out to destroy everything decent in the country. No one believes it. His ratings are through the ceiling. The worse the country gets socially, the, the happier the average person is because they want him to wreck everything. That's something you don't know. So I did a little politics. Now I'm going to do, again, the reviews, True Detective Ray Donovan. Loved Elliot Gould. No, they killed him off. I'm kind of sorry. His wackiness was great. John Voight, I always like him. He sucks. Every scene, all the light goes to him. If only they could trade Leif Schreiber for someone who's not as absurdly overly machismo. I mean, well, what's with the overly machismo? Every other scene he has to be either making, banging a woman against the wall or punching somebody. That's yeah, stupid. It's like a bad cartoon character. So anyway, whatever. That's one man's opinion. Linda on KSFO. Go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Okay. Normally, I don't call radio shows ever. But True Detective... That scene, that shootout scene, was the best I have ever seen. The so, well, you're agreeing that it's a, you're agreeing with me? It's the best shootout scene in the history of, of television or I, or movies, right? I couldn't believe it. It was. And here you are. Here you are, a woman, and I'm not diminishing it. You'd think only guys like shootout scenes. Did you find it as exciting as I did? Yes, and I don't like them. Oh, Done. so w what did you find engaging about the scene? Is that that the woman cop was leading the 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 shootout and how it shook her up? How it played out. The guy that I thought he was the mayor. The, you know the guy that drinks a lot with the mustache. Really, really, he's the real bad guy there. And he's, oh, the detective. Wait, Colin Firth. A uh, Colin oh. Farrell, rather. The, are you saying the detective with the mustache, Colin Farrell? Farrell? No, 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 not him, not him. He's Let's say he's in the good guy category. All right, we're getting too detailed for the average listener who doesn't even own a television set. Uh, so by and, large, by and large, you like True Detective. Now, is this the first time you've ever, you said you never call radio shows, but you've listened to the show, right? I'm faithful. I love you. Love you. Oh, thank God. I was, that was a close call. No, no, thank God. That was a close call. So here's a, a savage ad who listens to the show. Of the millions of listeners I have, I have 29 women who listen to this show around the country. And she's one of them. And I'm going to dare send you a copy of my Countdown to Mecca for your uh, literary group. You can bring it over and read it and whatever. 
So she called because she understood the shootout was amazing. What I thought was, and even if you didn't see the show, the, a woman cop, and she's tough as nails, leads the uh, charge against the Mexican cartel who outgun him. And after the last guy is shot by the two male cops with handguns, they shoot him like a pinata. I mean, he machine gun a lot of guys, and they got him cornered, and then he shoots a bus driver. So they wreck him. You know, they, they shoot like 20 holes in him. She is seen shaking. See, she ran out of bullets, and she's reaching for a little knife in her boot, which is absurd, but it's her survival instinct where she's going to go down fighting, which I thought was another interesting touch. But at the end of the shootout, there's not a word spoken between her and the two surviving cops, and there's a lot of dead bodies around them. And you see, basically, the Colin Farrell character's hand is shaking, as any man's hand would shake after a gunfight. And he reaches for a cigarette, and the other guy, right, and she is sitting there shaking, literally squatting down on the ground, bent over, almost throwing up from the, uh, from the fear and adrenaline of what she just went through and what she sees the aftermath. It was so well staged. It had to be staged by someone who's been in, in combat. There's no other explanation for it. You know, look, as a guy who writes novels, I got to tell you something. As hard as it is to write a novel, it's, it's becoming almost a moot point to write novels today because I would say that the greatest talent on the writing scene today is in television. It's not in the written, not in the book world. It's not in the book world. I mean, you need a team to come up with scenes like that. You know, one lead writer and maybe five other writers. And you need experts to advise you as to every motion in that scene. So that's why I'm not going to write any more of these novels. It's all going to be on the artistic side for me from here on in. Much different, more personal, more journalistic, whatever. I'll be back. Be here or be nowhere. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. All right, I already covered the reviews of uh, True Detective and Ray Donovan. Now, I don't want to spend an hour on it. I mean, I call here or there, whatever. John Voigt, great. Elliot Gould, sorry he's dead. Leif Schreiber, I could do without. You know what ruined it for Leif Schreiber with me? He was in a movie years ago, I think, something with the moon, uh, in, uh, 10 years ago, where he played a cuckold where the wife was cheating on him with the, the blouse man in Woodstock. And he was, I play like an ordinary weakling guy. And he, that set the style, it just looked like it really was him. More like him than, than, than the, the big macho guy. I don't know. That's, you know he's, he grew up in a very uh, artistic home. I think he trained to be a ballet dancer. Nothing against him on that. Not implying anything. Uh, there are very strong ballet dancers, I hear, somewhere in uh, Greece. I never heard of them, met them, saw them. Occasionally, there's a, I don't know, ballet, who knows? There must be a man amongst the ballet dancers. Who knows? That's an interesting field. You've got to be in some shape to be a ballet dancer. Do their legs go to like 50, the ankles? Like most football players, they're shot by 50. They're like, uh, the body's gone. Oh, and they're young. They could break your neck with it with a looking at you. By 50, they're already gone. It's so the wimp wins at 50. The wimp keeps on going. 60, the wimp gets stronger. 70. The other guys fell by the... <laughs> You look back in high school, you know, everything's reversed. Everyone you thought was smart, they're either dead or they're in jail or they, they burned out. The kids who were like slower than them, they're the ones who are still, you know, chugging along. Go figure that one out. What do you want to do now? I don't, I'm tired of it all now. I don't want to do any more Trump. All I got is calls about Trump now. I, I, we know Trump's wonderful. We don't know if he's real. We don't know how long he's going to last, run, whatever. What a long time it is between now and the... And the Republicans suck. They're the worst in the history of the world. Everything he says is what the American people want to hear. That's why they hate him. He shook things up for the establishment, didn't he? But to go to the extent of uh, the others in insanity. The View co-host, uh, Raven Simone, says that it was Trump who actually set up the... I swear to God, this was on television. She said, this woman, Raven Simone, which I still don't know whether it is a medical syndrome or a person's name. I never trust anyone with a hyphenated last name to begin with. That's a holdover from people with low self-esteem. 
They usually have hyphenated last names to make you think that they're more important than they are. But anyway, here's someone with a hyphenated last name on ABC who says Donald Trump killed Catherine Steinle in San Francisco. Listen to clip 28. Interesting that this happened as soon as Trump started to talk about this. He randomly found a gun from sure a federal the criminal agent. wasn't no, watching but I'm just, CNN. I'm, but look at the news. They reported it. They should have been showing more of these beforehand. For instance, I just feel it's very interesting. And how do you feel about Trump talking about Hillary, about how she, if she's president, there's going to be just a flood of murders and a flood of things going on? Okay, now this is on television. This creature, this syndrome, Raven Simone. So she's implying that Donald Trump killed the girl and the woman in the streets of San Francisco because the gun was then this and that. It's a beyond belief. Can you imagine what we're living through? It's like a purge of intelligence in the United States of America. What else do I have in sound? I got to touch on some of it. The guys work so hard from five in the morning. I'm going on bike rides now in the morning. I am bike ride morning and then after the show. Instead of sleeping, I'm jumping on the bike. That lucky old son ain't got nothing to do but roll around savage all day. I'm, I'm on that bicycle again. Haven't lost an ounce. I'm eating more as a result. I'm gaining weight from bicycle. <laughs> no, it's the funniest thing. I'm bicycling, so I'm hungry. So instead of like sticking to my Spartan diet, yesterday I went and had French fries for lunch. I couldn't resist. There's a burger joint. I, all I wanted, I was craving them. All right, so I got them, you know, they're good oil and all of that, right? Yeah, really good oil. Each French fry is like 1,000 calories, whatever, 100 calories, like a beer. Each fry is like dr drinking a beer. <laughs> I asked for a double order. All right, with no salt. I don't need the sodium. A turkey burger on the side from hunger, garbage. Better off with a hamburger. Well, I had a turkey burger. Who knows what they put in there? Oh, it's a hippie burger, right? It's supposed to be better for me. If you look at the garbage they ground up between the, the turkey and the, the tofu and the celery stalks that they put in there, who says a turkey burger is better for me than actual Angus burger at McDonald's? So I don't normally eat that kind of stuff. It goes back to how I was raised. We trusted nobody. You remember the famous story in the Catskill Mountains in, a, in an August, a hot July or August, South Fallsburg, New York, true story, Catskill Mountains, Yours truly, Michael Savage, was a delivery boy. I was a butcher boy. I was about, I could just drive. I was 16. They got a busted old Plymouth that we used to deliver meat in. Like, the, they would, like, call in the orders, even then. And I would drive it around. I was like a Chinese immigrant. I would drive. You think about it. I didn't think it was a humiliating job. When someone was being poor and making a buck, they give you a couple of dollars tip, whatever. Some were cheap. They give you nothing. So you taint their meat the next time. <laughs> I didn't engage in it. There were kids who were bad. They were mean. I don't have a mean streak in me. I really don't. The ones who did went into either medicine or uh, the garment center. And so uh, the butcher, the butcher, the butcher. So it's a hot day. My aunt comes into the butcher store. And mind you, this guy knows us. He's like, a, he, like every, he knows everyone in the community. He's not like a strange butcher in Safeway. And she, she points out a steak in the, in the uh, case. And she says, Sam, grind it up for me, would you please? My son has asthma. I want you to make chop meat for me. Sure, I'll do it for you. Don't worry, darling, Bella. Don't, uh, you darling. And he'd go into the freezer with it. I was the butcher boy. What he would do is he would take the steaks and put them on the top shelf, and he would take pre-ground, lesser quality meat and give it to the people. My aunt was on to him. She was a Russian immigrant. She didn't trust him, even though he gave her the Bella job. She wore an, uh, a fur coat to the butcher's sh store in August. She took it in the car to go into the freezer with him. And he was like, what are you doing? No, no, she says, I just want to see you grinding it up. She, she wasn't ashamed, you know what I'm saying? Like today, everyone's ashamed to catch the purveyor in the act. So for her, she got the ground up uh, steak. The others got the pre-ground, the kind of stuff you're buying now, like mixed meat from uh, Bolivia, from Bolivian stable droppings. <laughs> Who would eat a hamburger in a restaurant today? God knows where it comes from. I love every Colby beef. Oh, man, that's $85. That must be good. Probably stable droppings with a taint of meat in it. Everyone, what, do you know what you're eating? I liked fish restaurants in the old days when the guy with the, the tuxedo would come out with a tray and he'd show you the fish and you could smell it. They can't do it today for health reasons. Who would buy a fish unless you could see the thing before you eat it? The Chinese are smart. They, you pick one out of a, 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 a tank. 
and you want the swiftest fish, you don't want one uh, laying upside down. Well, you're going to pick one that's upside down and dead in the tank? No. It's like lox. It looks like a dead lox laying there. You want the swift fish. They don't care. They knock the head off. Okay, bang, crash. The chicken squawks cut the head off. Why do they care? Everything's food. Whatever moves is food. A dog eat it. A goose eat it. A duck knock its head off. He don't know from Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, nothing. Just knock the head off and get the fat out of it. That's all. So here we are years later and life goes on. I'm enjoying myself. The audience probably left me already, but because all they want to hear is Trump, good, Trump, good, Trump, good, save America. Trump will say, yeah, step right up. Step right up this way to the egress. Yes, that Trump, save America. I hope so. You know, get back to me November, December. I'll let you know how interested I am in the candidacies. Some already you know what I think of them. I told you who they were six months ago. I told you Rubio was a zero and he'd flame out. Bingo, gone. I said he was an ice cream man in Miami that they found with a vowel for a last name that they picked. The guys had nobody. Zero, nothing. What has he got to offer? Uh, president, President Marco Rubio. <laughs> no, can't see it. President Ted Cruz, great ideas, can't be president. Weasley voice, won't work, and shift the eyes. Don't trust him. Sorry. And also, he stabbed us on the trade deal. So that was already a show, a show thing. Now we got Scott Walker, who I backed three months ago. I don't know. I don't know who these guys are. Where do they get them from? Jeez. And what's the option? A her again? Fruit from the jungle floor again we got to have? Why her of all Democrats must it be her? Why must it be that creature from the Black Lagoon? Again, we didn't have enough of the Clintons? The dirt, the scandals, the deaths, the horrors, the selling the secrets to China. How much can we take of this? And who's on the Republican side? Who's left? Jeb Bush? You must be joking. The name Bush is toxic in America, by the way. It's a toxic name. The only person who likes the Bush name is Sean Hannity because he invited him to the White House for a corned beef and cabbage. That's it. No one else trusts the name. So I don't know which way to turn here. I mean, I, I, of course I'll take any Republican over these communists. I get it. Yeah, but what is the Republican going to do? We voted for them in November, I told you to vote. A lot of good it did. Look what we got. Huh. Okay, there's Fiorina. The name alone is a, is, a, is, a, is a death march. she got to change her name to something like Francine. No one's electing anyone with a name like, okay, let's try Fiorina in clip 15. Let's hear Fiorina. Donald Fiorina. Trump taps into an anger that I hear every day. People are Good angry voice, huh? that a common sense thing like securing the border or ending mm -hmm. sanctuary cities is somehow considered extreme. It's not extreme. It's common sense. Right. We need to secure right. the border. People are okay. also angry at a professional political class of both okay. parties that talks a good game, gives good speeches, but somehow nothing ever really changes. And people are angry as well at a double standard in the media. She could win. She's good. What'd she run? Hewlett Packard? I don't remember what she ran. She ran it horribly? All right. Whatever. Fiorina. I don't know her last name. What's her last Oh, Carly Fiorina. Sorry. I thought Fiorina was the first name. I got it backwards. I keep thinking Carly Simon. I Carly Fiorina. The name. She's got a name problem for branding. But that's the name that she was born with. Okay, I'm not knocking it. Could she be could she be president? She's got a nice voice on her, a good delivery, and she, she made good sense there. But I remember when she was running for governor of the state of California, she shot herself in the foot. Because I had her on a local show, I think, or someone did. And she was in favor of uh, amnesty for illegals, by the way. That was the end of her campaign. The, the conservatives did not come out for her. Now, the worst of the Republicans is this Lindsey Graham. This guy is a weasel rhino of the lowest order. Listen to clip 18 when he attacks Trump because he's jealous that no one knows who he is. Lindsey Graham in 18. At the end of the day, for us to win a national election, we have to do better with Hispanics. And for us to have the moral authority as a party to govern a great nation, we have to reject this demagoguery. But if we don't, we will lose and we will deserve to lose. All right, fine. He's the guy who doesn't have any uh, women in his life. And uh, not, not that that's the whole thing. They said, well, who'll be the first lady if you win? You hear the answer he gave about a month ago? What an answer that was. He says, I'll have uh, rotating wives as first ladies. Rotating first ladies. That was some answer, Graham. 
Yeah, yeah, I get that. You have any children? No, but I have nephews and nieces. I heard that before. I get it. All right. Move it along. Uh, all right, next one. Uh, Graham, Trump's comments are offensive. All right, play play the Panada Graham again. <laughs> He'll be our Panada today. Play <laughs> Lindsey Graham, clip 20, the Panada of sound. I can tell you the majority of my party wants to secure the border, control who gets a job. They come here That's to work. Uh, what happened in San Francisco is appalling. It's no, a it's good murder. example of why you need to fix the system. But yeah, to yeah, say yeah. that all the 11 million illegal immigrants, for the most part, are rapists he didn't and drug say dealers, that. is not only on a, a offensive right, no, at every over. level. You know he's a nobody. I feel, t- tell your story walking, Johnny. The most Lindsey Graham could be is what he is. I don't know how he got that far. So Graham is angry that Trump moved ahead of him. Graham has nothing to offer. Nikki Haley attacked him too? Oh, God. What's this now? Call Rove. I'm sorry. I was never a fan of Call Rove. The only one who liked Call Rove is Fox News. And I'm sorry to be offensive about it. I don't like his policies. He was called Bush's brain, uh, just as Axelrod is known as Obama's brain. But I don't know. There's something about Call Rove's looks that's you just give me the chills. I think Stalag 17. When I see Carl Rovin on the wrong side of that one as well, on that balance sheet, if you kind of... So he attacks Trump, too. Sanders is still running. The commie, Sanders from New York, the weasel. This guy, Sanders, is like a classic New York commie from the 1930s who uh, no one would listen to. They'd get a soapbox in Union Square, Manhattan, and they'd rail against capitalism. Look how far he's gotten. That's because they're importing communists into the country as a rapid a pace as they can. If you import socialist people from socialist countries who want handouts, of course Sanders will appeal to them because he says he's going to give you more handouts. But just for the fun of listening to the guy's voice, I love it in 25 and 26, run him. Run I him, think Sam. what the Pope has been saying in a very profound and deep way oh, come on. is that casino type capitalism uh, and, uh, is causing a Jewish devastating communi- problems. Here's a Jewish Bolshevik. Suddenly he's a lover of the Pope. I love this. I love this. Here's a guy who spit on the church his whole life in the most vile manner, hated the church, called everyone a molester. Now all of a sudden, the Pope, the Pope, this is anti-capitalism. Unbelievable. You can't see two and two. You can't put two and two together. All of a sudden, the, 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 the Bernie Sanders loves the Pope. I love it. I love it, Robert. I'm going to take a departure for three minutes. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It is the Savage Nation. Can you believe two hours have gone by already? I mean, it's a nice day. It's summertime. And I wasn't going to let Obama steal my summer. And I said to you, how important are the elections to you this early? There has to be more in life. I said that to you. And I also said to you that people don't listen to the show solely for politics. And I played you some great sound, uh, such as a lunatic on The View, who says that uh, Trump killed a woman in San Francisco. Unbelievable what passes for allowability on on rad television today. And uh, Obama's a nut. No matter what he gets, not enough for him. Not enough. One Supreme Court, victory after victory after victory. Now he wants to bus uh, people into white neighborhoods. The man is ill. This is an ill communist. Nothing is enough for him. Then we touched on Trump. And then we touched on this and the that, the that, the this. I read The Death of the White Male. I told you about the great sales of my novel Countdown to Mecca. And you should be ashamed of yourself that you loved the show and didn't buy the book. Oh, look ashamed. (laughs) Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, 
culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. And you are alive. You are alive, Michael. Well, here we are in hour number three. Still summer. Nothing's changed. And I think the best thing to do this hour is to open it up to calls at 855-407-282. You know what I've been talking about. And um, if you care to comment on any of the topics, you can do so. Let's begin with a song, though, The Elegance Little Star on the Savage Nation, an old doo-wop song. Actually, that one is not doo-wop per se. It's just 50s rock and roll, which I happen to love. People like it. Even young people love the 50s. Uh, I hated the 50s myself. It was horrible. When this song was popular, Barack Obama was not even a glint in his grandfather's eye. When this song was popular, Hillary Clinton was already putting on... Oh, no, sorry. I was going to say putting on weight. I shouldn't say that's not right. I have a weight problem myself. Uh, when this song was popular, Donald Trump lived five blocks from where I lived. He lived on the other side of the track. <laughs> uh, when this song was popular, Mexico was really Mexico. Today it runs America. When this song was popular, you get the picture. When this song was popular, Ted Cruz was still in Havana. When this song was popular... Al Sharpton was figuring out what to do with an old pair of sweatpants. When this song was popular, there was no NPR, so they were still in America. When this song was popular, there was, uh, where was Lindsey Graham? Well, we don't want to talk about that. It's a family show. <laughs> when, <laughs> when this song was popular, Nikki Haley was not even known. She still isn't known. When this song was popular, Carl Rove was seeking his niche. When this song was popular, Pope Francis was... Painting graffiti on Argentinian walls. And here we are on the Savage Nation. Let's go to the callers. Line number seven, Margaret on WJR in Detroit. Margaret, what's on your mind? What's uh, what's happening? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Savage, sir. Um, I'm a new listener, and I'm a nervous wreck talking to you. I feel rather starstruck. And you, you, you feel Savage Workshop? Starstruck. Oh, come on. People who know me, that they know that I'm a genius, but I'm also a regular guy in that sense. Yes, I'm a, I'm a comedic genius and this and that. I have genius in me. But at the end of the day, what does that really mean? I work very hard and I study very hard and I have a great delivery. What does it really mean? Genius is 99%. Uh, insp is 99% uh, how, did they, how did that go? Genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. You've heard that, right? I, I've heard that. My grandfather was an engineer at U.S. Steel back in oh. in the fifties, so or forties. So he was he was one of those great brains, huh? He was a great brain, Walter Everling. He was an inventor and an engineer at U.S. Steel. But my purpose for calling you today um, is because. I, I heard you, like, you were telling your story. You're like, do you want to read it? Do you want, do you want me to read it? Do you want me to read it? And I felt like a dog waiting for a treat with my tail wagging. And you read that story, and I, I hope you post it. But wait, which story is it? Which story are you referring to, Margaret? Um, the story that you wrote in 1977. Oh, the death of the white male. Yeah. So, oh, yay. Written in the Sierra Nevada Mountains when the ACLU, run by all liberal white communists, decided that white boys need not apply no matter what their A average may be. They aced them out of all the universities, which is why the university have turned into cesspools today. Yeah, so you know, I've seen the best minds of my generation driven out of academia. As a result, academia is, in a, is a, not quite where it should be. Let's put it to you that way. I won't get vulgar. Yeah, I don't know about posting it. I have it copyrighted, but I hear that, Margaret. Margaret, my friend, my new friend, my new listener on JR, I'm sending you a copy of my brilliant novel, Countdown to Mecca. Great summer reading. And she said, like, the tail, the dog wagging. I, it struck me as funny that she would say she felt like a, a canine with a tail wagging waiting to hear the story. Because I was going to read it, psychic. I was going to read The Twelve Shortest Lived Dogs. Number 12, the Scottish Deerhound. Number 12, the Scottish Deerhound. They live to a minimum of eight years and a maximum of nine years. They are known to be aggressive, cheerful, and good with children. Number 11 is the Chinese Sharpei. Average life expectancy, eight years. 
Known as the Chinese fighting dog, the Sharpe is loyal, playful, and protective. This breed has an average height of 19 inches and a minimum of and maximum life expectancy of 7 to 10 years. Next on the list of the 12 shortest living dogs is the Great Dane at number 10. Average life expectancy, 8 years. They're big dogs, growing as tall as 43 inches. Minimum of 7 and a maximum of 10 years. Uh, next is the St. Bernese. With an average life expectancy of 8 years, the St. Bernese is a hybrid between the St. Bernard and the Bernese Mountain Dog. It is known to live from 6 to 10 years. It's a working breed, meaning a St. Bernese can be trained to assist people with various tasks. They tend to be energetic and intelligent, which means they are hated by Democrats. The next breed that is short-lived is the St. Pyrenees, with an average life expectancy of eight years. This cross between a St. Bernard and a Great Pyrenees is also a working dog, which means it is hated by the Democrats. St. Pyrenees live an average of eight years, with six years being the minimum and ten years the maximum life expectancy. They are playful and energetic and therefore require frequent exercise, which is why they're hated by Democrats. Next on the list of short-lived dogs is the Irish Dane, with an average, average life expectancy of eight years. Irish Danes live a minimum of seven and a maximum of ten years and can weigh up to 200 pounds. Their relatively short lifespan can be attributed to Obamacare, I mean joint problems that occur frequently in this particular dog. Next on the list is the St. Berdoodle, with an average life ex expectancy of eight years, the St. Berdoodle is a cross between a St. Bernard and a Poodle. They usually live a minimum of six and a maximum of ten years. They're energetic and intelligent and tend to be healthy, but their ears and eyes should be checked often to make sure they haven't become Republicans. Next on the list is the, Ber <laughs> Next on the, list is the Bernie's Roti, with an average life expectancy of eight years. It is prone to obesity due to its relatively large size, and that makes it a perfect Democrat a voter. Next is, is the St. Dane at number four with an average life expectancy of eight years. It's known to live from six to ten years and weigh from 100 to 200 pounds. This playful and protective breed doesn't have many health issues to speak of, but it does need a good amount of exercise, which means it's hated by Carl Rove. Next on the list is the Bernese Mountain Dog. With an average life expectancy of seven years, the Bernese have a minimum life expectancy of six years and a maximum life expectancy of nine years. These are purebred working dogs that can grow to 28 inches and weigh 100 pounds. As a result, they're not permitted in Greece, where nobody works, not even the dogs. Many of these loving dogs are prone to developing a variety of different forms of cancer, including malignant histiocytosis, lymphosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, and osteosarcoma, which is why their average life expectancy is shorter than most other breeds. Let's hope that Obamacare is not applied to the canines next, because they won't live a day. Number two on the list of short-lived dogs is the Dog de Bordeaux. It tends to live a minimum of five and a maximum of eight years. The most common cause of its short lifespan is cancer. Over a third of these instances of cancer were lymphosarcoma. They are also known to suffer from heart disease. The breed also has hip dysplasia, also common in German shepherds, and elbow dysplasia. No comment there because that's not a joke. Number one, and by, these are my favorite, is the Irish Wolfhound with an average life expectancy of six years. Irish Wolfhounds are large, strong dogs and grow up to 38 inches tall. They are known to live from only five to seven years. This short lifespan is due to the fact that they lay on Irish bar floors and lop up the beer and the scotch that hits the ground. The diseases are hard to diagnose because wolfhounds tend to remain stoic even when they're in pain. Well, okay, that's the list of short-lived dogs. I knew one Irish wolfhound. I love the dog. My friend, I haven't seen him in years, he had a uh, Irish pub in North Beach, and I forget, he's uh, out of business, and he had a dog. I never, I never met an Irish wolfhound until I saw Fionn. And uh, Fian did lay on the bar floor. I never saw a dog run like this Irish wolfhound. It was a summer day, you see. And we're out in the streets of San Francisco's North Beach. And Fian came out with uh, sawdust on his body after laying around listening to all of the stories that uh, the malarkey that the Irish were throwing to each other. 
And he laid there, and all of a sudden he came in the street with my friend who owned the bar, and there was another dog down the street. Well, this Irish wolfhound took off, and he ran down that whole street on Green Street. It looked like in four strides, four lopes. He was already to the next street. Magnificent creature, sad to see he died. That's why I don't get big, long, uh, short-lived dogs. I tend to like the little guys who they say live 15 to 20. I'm looking forward to the day that I hear that Toy poodles live to 50. And on that note, I'll take a quick break and return right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It is the sad. I wish there were 15 people in the Democrat race. Then maybe we'd have a, a democracy instead of the Arkansas uh, gang. Uh, that's it? That's the whole candidacy is her? Bursting out of the pumps? People are trying to find Judy Garland's pumps that were stolen. Uh, couldn't be hers because the feet were bursting out. Yeah, what else is left to do? All we can do is ridicule. That's all we have left. We have no democracy. One party system. You got that moron Chuck Todd grew a beard to look intelligent. He compares Trump to a George Wallace. I mean, that's the best that that moron Chuck Todd could do. On tenth rate intellect, and no wonder Obama sits before him for an interview. The stooge. The guy's like a lampshade. Chuck Todd is a lampshade with a beard. All right, let's go to the intelligent people out there. Those who listen to the Savage Nation have the, the nerve to call Sid on KVOR Radio. Sid, welcome to. Sid, what's on your mind? Well, I just wanted to make a comment on a, on a statement that you made right before the break. I happen to have a toy poodle who is going to be 25 years old. This oh, time. my God. It's like a Ripley's Believe It or Not job. Yeah, he's, he's quite the little dog. Mine is, tw mine is 11. He can still jump up to my shoulders, like if you hold up a greenie. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Here's what I here's what I fed mine. I pray he lives because I I can't. I don't want life without him. I don't. I don't mean that. I mean life without him would be pretty empty. I'm not going to get another dog. This is the end of the road. I'm too close to this one, and I have the ashes of all the other ones around. I can't take it anymore. One more is going to be the last straw. I feed my dog kibble, fresh chickens. I get a chicken, maybe three chickens a week. Cut up some chicken and carrots. He likes carrots. What do you give your dog? Well, my dog's been getting science diet, and uh, it's the uh, uh, adult fitness small breed. I don't know. That's not a plug for them. Works well for him. That's and fun. His eyes are still clear. He still hears well. He's not much on jumping anymore. Uh, but you don't you don't give him you don't give him any meat. No no roast beef. No chicken. Nothing. Uh, occasionally, uh, he'll get something like that, but not very much of it. And no, usually, so you, you, I try to limit chicken. You don't, you don't, you don't, you, you know, you, you don't give them human food, in other words. No, very well, I, I, that's not strictly true. Like I said, I'll give him some chicken if I have chicken. And occasionally I'll give him a little bit of my steak if I have steak. But that's, that's about the limit. That's, that's all. Amazing. Well, I met a woman the other day who came up and she said she had one that lived to 21 or 22. And that he also liked carrots. And she said he liked broccoli. So weird, last night I went to a Japanese restaurant. Of course, I couldn't get Teddy any food. He doesn't like sushi and he doesn't drink sake. But uh, I did take the carrots off the plate and give him. And you know what? He, he ate the broccoli because uh, he liked that. So I'm starting to feed him some broccoli with the food. That's beautiful that yours is 26 years old. And is, is, it the, is it the best dog you've ever had in breed-wise? Breed uh, he is certainly the most intelligent and the most well-behaved. I mean, he... He was a little oh. difficult to train early on as a puppy, but once he got it, he's he's had it his whole life. And he's oh, yesterday, it. yesterday Teddy played in a yesterday Teddy, my my little dog. He likes to play in a kiddie pool. He has a fetish for jumping in in a swimming pool. He always wants to go in if someone's in there because they you know they're water dogs and they want to save you. Teddy jumped in the bay to save a swimmer once, and it was astounding. So he's a war. You put him around water, he wants to go in it. I got to keep him out of the pool because there's chlorine and he drinks it. So I got him a, a kiddie pool and he played for hours in the kiddie pool with little floating ducks. Would you believe it? It's like, they're like children. They really are. They're like little children. Isn't it odd that there's only one group of people on the planet who hate dogs? 
There's only one group of people on the whole planet who hate dogs and treat women worse than camels. How is that, how is that even possible that they're allowed into this country? It's possible that they're allowed into this reality. I don't think they're in this reality. It's from the inbreeding, by the way. You know, when you marry first cousins for a thousand years, it tends to produce hatred and psychosis. But look, a Democrat voter is a Democrat voter. It wouldn't matter if it was a machine to the Democrat machine. All right, my friend, I got a book for you. It's uh, Countdown to Mecca. I got another caller coming up. I don't have the time for this. I got a caller, Jeff, on WBAB. is asking me which of your books has given you the most lasting satisfaction. Nobody in my life has ever asked me that. Of the 28 or 29 books I have written and published, had published, no one's asked me that question. It's forcing me to think about it. I don't know if I'll get to it right now. I'd say it's reducing the risk of Alzheimer's. 25 years ahead of its time. Unknown book. Unknown book worthy of a Nobel Prize. I'm not kidding you. Try to find the copy. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Tell me this doesn't rip every, every piece of DNA in your body up to the... It's unbelievable to me, these songs. They're so powerful. Any one of those singers would have made a better president than Obama. They would have drawn the country together through joy and beauty rather than through hatred and division. Dividing everybody, conquering everybody. I'm a madman. Anyway, I'm trying to get away from politics for a minute. 855 47282. We're talking about short lived dogs, long lived dogs, what to feed them, books, politics. <clears throat> Jeff on BOB Radio, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's your topic, Jeff? Well, Dr. Savage, you answered my question just before the break about uh, the book that you uh, has given you the most satisfaction. I must say my favorite of all of yours uh, uh, has to be Psychological Nudity. Uh, that, oh, uh, you remember that book. That came out before Train Tracks. And so the follow-up with Train Tracks, I just love your story. So you've given me much pleasure through the years with your books and your show, and That's I just wanted to thank you. That's very sweet of you. I really appreciate that. Let me give you a copy of Countdown to Mecca. It's a great book if you don't have it. If you do, you can give it away. But, yeah, Psychological Nudity was an important book for me because they were my radio stories. And then Harper, Collins, uh, Morrow, sorry, Morrow Division, I think, came out with Train Tracks, and uh, they were my uh, family stories. I liked that book a lot. It was from the heart. It was like one from the heart. Several of those stories could become... I mean, they're movies. And uh, the opening is I really was poor, which is very funny. It's two pages long. I don't know if I want to read it. Now read that one. For those of you who don't know who I am. At my recent birthday party, my son got up to give a little speech about his dad. And he mentioned something intriguing. Here's what he said. Quote, when my dad told me that he was so poor when he was young that he actually wore a dead man's pants, I thought he was just exaggerating, as I often think he does. Uh, but tonight before the party, he showed me childhood pictures that were just sent to him from relatives for this book. I was astounded to see he actually was wearing pants, hand-me-downs, five times too large, <laughs> cut off at the knee. I couldn't believe his family was actually that poor, close quote. Well, that's the end of that quote. In reviewing the photographs in this book, you will see that exact picture. Me standing beneath my aunt straddled by my sister and my cousin, wearing dead man's pants. Every word that you read in this book is as true as that photograph. That's pretty good. See, this is stoic, stark writing. Sorry, stark, stark. It's almost unheard of in this florid age where everybody embellishes. Stark, stark. Now, in there, there's a story called An American Gangster in Spain set in Mallorca, which is really, it's almost, as, it's a, it make for a good, good uh, almost for a good movie. Then, uh, let's see, there's another one in there. I don't know, you're not interested in an old book. But the stories will live on. But no, the most important book that I ever wrote was called Reducing the Risk of Alzheimer's. It's unknown to this, to this day. And it was published in 1987. And it was ahead of its time by several decades. In summary, I described things that are pretty standardly acceptable today in the field of medicine. And most of the treatments are ineffective, as you all well know, for Alzheimer's disease. And the, the, the movement is towards prevention. And the not nullification 
of the amyloid plaques, but slowing down the progress of the development of these plaques in the brain. And I was talking about using antioxidants, which of course everyone talks about these days, in this book back in 1987. It went nowhere. No one, nobody really paid any attention to the book. I mean, luckily I'm still alive to talk about my own work, but 1987, when I talked about antioxidants, the medical establishment laughed at me. I also talked about aluminum and Alzheimer's disease, which should not be omitted in your discussion of it. You have to understand how dangerous this neurotoxic metal is. You must understand that. If you want to know anything about this disease, you should look into the dangers of aluminum. And this has been completely hushed up, pushed aside, buried by the pharmaceutical medical establishment. And yet at the time, Alzheimer's was the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. So I don't know. I don't have any more to say about that. The book gave me great pleasure because it was so important. And you, you, what are you going to judge a book in terms of how many it sells? I don't think so. There are other books that I was in the office I pulled out. For example, here's the German edition of Indiana Medizin. Das Jurat. I can't read German. I want to make a fool of myself. It's the my 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 first published book called American in the um, Earth Medicine Earth Foods in in German. That was that when I wrote that book, after years as a poet and a short story writer and a struggling novelist, when I finally broke through and wrote Earth Medicine, it was published in 1972 by Macmillan Publishing. They kept it in print for over 20 years. It's an important book, not only in its time, but to this day. And it went into like six languages. This is the German. Then, of course, in, during the AIDS hysteria, by the way, whatever happened to AIDS? I was thinking about the other day. Where did where'd that go? Remember when everyone was afraid of getting AIDS for a long while? What happened to AIDS? Where did it go? I mean, I hate to be blunt about it, but isn't unprotected sex sort of the norm now in certain communities? How did that all of a sudden happen? How could certain communities suddenly engage in such risky sex and there's no AIDS? Where did AIDS go? I don't know where it went. Anyway, during the, the heyday of AIDS in the early 80s, I wrote uh, uh, Maximum Immunity, which Houghton Mifflin published, and I hold in my hand the, uh, I think the Danish edition. I can't read Danish. Yeah, it's the Danish edition, I think. Ex Libris Alternative Booker. So I like all of these books. You know, one of these days I should put them all on the wall. Just look at them. It's been a lifetime of hard work. I wrote a novel years ago called Vital Signs that no one knows about. 1983 by Avon Books. No one can find that book. Oh, that's a great picture of me. It's like a double, uh, a, a double exposure of me. Michael has written several best-selling books on nutrition and health. Uh, he's a dedicated uh, catalog of medicinal plants in the Fiji Islands. He holds a PhD from University of California, Berkeley, in nutritional health and medicine. The first such degree given he is on the faculty of University of Santa Cruz. That was two years of research associate. Look how thin I was. My God. Black beard, black hair. I mean, I'd be considered a hipster today. If I walked down the street looking like that, wow, they think I'm a liberal. Some ghost of my former self. Unbelievable. Size 32 waist. I couldn't even put that over a foot now. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't base my health on how much I weigh, and you shouldn't either. Weight should not be the sole measure of your of your health status believe me there's a lot of many other factors you know so we i don't want to do a health show maybe you do want to do it i don't know eight five my most important last book in the history of the world in the nonfiction is coming out in october i finished it over the weekend i almost died finishing it with the copy editor i almost fainted i had to go back to sleep at 10 in the morning woke up at six worked for two hours on a last minute and it's in copy editing it's from the same great publisher who did Stop the Coming Civil War. And I, I don't know if the title's up on Amazon yet. Robert, can you check to see because before someone steals it by the morning? My next great book and my last nonfiction book is called Government Zero. There, I've told you the title. And I will tell you that when you read it, your heart will stop. Nobody has ever done a book as good as this in nonfiction. Nobody will ever exceed it in politics. That's my opinion. And the same publisher who did Stop the Coming Civil War, you know, when you're too close to a, 
something like this. I keep saying, I don't know how good it is. She said to me, my publisher, she said, it's better than stop the coming civil war. And that's coming out in October. That's the end of the big nonfiction blockbusters. I won't do it anymore. A $5 million advance would be too little for the amount of energy and work and hard work it took to do that. I can't do it. It was every day of my life for almost a year. Or you don't know that in addition to the show, I'm writing the book. It's unbelievable. It's like nonstop, like a conveyor belt. People don't know how hard it is to do these things. And that'll be it. That'll be that. Then it'll be after that. It's going to be different kind of things, more stories and more of the uh, stuff that I like. My journals are going to come out next year, 1963 to 1969. For those of you who are fanatically interested in yours truly, and there is an audience for this. I kept journals, handwritten journals, for many, many years before I went into radio. I was an obsessive journal writer. And all my travels in the Fiji Islands and my this and my that, writing in little hotel rooms, thinking I was the literary equivalent of Iacometti, the sculptor, I remember working in a small hotel room that I used to keep in North Beach to go and write in San Francisco. It was an SRO hotel with a lot of people on welfare in the hotel. Believe it, I'm telling you the truth, no one knows this. I had a shared bathroom on the floor, and there was a lot of downtrodden people. I got to know some of them. Some were nice people, some weren't. Some were down on their luck. Some would just like to live poor, pensioners. A shared bathroom on the floor. So I sat in that little room, and I wrote. I wrote in, obsessively in the 80s. Because they wouldn't hire me. You gotta understand something. Here I worked to become a professor and they said, drop dead, you're a white male, we're not hiring you. So instead of curling up into a ball and dying, I continued to earn a living and I continued to write. I put all my energy into writing. And I remember reading that during the war, meaning the war, World War II, the great Italian sculptor, Iacometti, created his the little the sculptures of the thin men. You know those figures? Look them up. Yacometti, G-I-A-C-O-M-E-T-T-I, Yacometti. He did sculptures of small figures in a small hotel room as he, he, he wrote out the war in a, in a Parisian hotel room. That inspired me to do small stories on a miniature scale. You follow what I'm saying? Does that make sense to anybody? So I took my inspiration from him. 855 Let's go back to the dog question. WBAP Jess, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind, Jess? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman earlier called about said had a dog that lived at 25. I had an aunt that had uh, two of the small poodles, one of them named Velvet that lived at 28, and one of them, uh, Bingo, that lived at 25. And she would feed them uh, two hot dog weenies in the evening with half an aspirin in them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that dog must have been a born Texan. And it was even rumored that she would give him an Ativan in there every once in a while. <laughs> uh, a what? What, what, what drug? And, What's an Ativan? What is it? It's like a Valium. Kind of like a Valium. I guess she she it, doped, it, the, she I, doped uh, the poodles up because they were so jumpy, right? The, I, I don't give Teddy any drugs. But it's a funny story. You're saying you, she fed them hot dogs and they lived that long? Yeah, probably about once they got about 15, you know, probably like the last 10, then, you know, 13 years of their life, she would give them a... Uh, They'd have trouble, uh, problems chewing, so she'd give them the hot dog weenies, and she'd put half an aspirin in there. So I guess they isn't that something and whatnot. What she fed him a hot dog every night? Y yes, sir. At least one wow. every night, and she'd leave a little bit of kibble out, you know, during the day for him. Oh, they hate kibble. The only the only animals that eat kibble are the rats that get into the house or the mice. Do, uh, my dog, if I put the kibble, I I do it every day. I put the kibble. I chop up the ch I cut the chicken. I put in the carrots. Of course, he eats the chicken and leaves the kibble and the carrots, basically. They're not, they're not stupid. I wouldn't eat the kibble either if I could get a fresh chicken breast. <laughs> hey, my friend, I'm sending you my novel, Countdown to Mecca. I'm sure you'll love it. It's a long, hot summer. You got to do something. Rob, 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 WTMA Radio. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Rob, what's on your mind? We had, we've had great success. Um, utilizing ALA and DMSA to eradicate um, plaque in the brain and removing toxic metal. Hold on, that's an important statement. You used what to do so? ALA and DMSA to eradicate, minimize plaque and mercury and any heavy metal damage to a child's 
brain or an adult. We've done that. It's worked very are, well. Are, are, you, are you in a medic? Are you, do you work in a medical clinic? Um, I can't say where I work because it's, it's stuff that the uh, people in charge, if you know what I mean, Yes, I get it. Very right, it's something because it it probably may work. The government would put you in jail. It works. It, it, now, it a al explain to my audience what ALA is. Um, it is a chemical, and DMSA is a specific chemical. I can't go into it more because it attracts attention. But what the ALA does is it removes uh, it, it it removes mercury from the from the brain, it DMSA removes all the other toxic metals from the brain. Whether it is right. Uh, well, right, what well, does it does it remove aluminum? Yes, absolutely. And you know how toxic aluminum is to to uh, neuro to uh, to brain cells. People don't understand how dangerous aluminum really is. Okay, Rob, thanks for that uh, tip. I'll look into that. I have avoided aluminum my entire life. I'm going to give you an example. I could do it in one, one second. I don't use aluminum cookware. Of course, in restaurants, it's all aluminum. That's number one. I'm going to give you an example for your own experimental purposes. I want you to, when you get a piece of pizza and bring it home, wrap it tightly in a piece of aluminum foil, right? During the evening that that pizza is sitting in the, that slice is sitting in the, in the fridge, it will react. The tomato sauce in the, in the pizza will react with the aluminum. And in a chemical reaction, aluminum will be absorbed into that slice of pizza. That's an example of how reactive aluminum is in acid, uh, with acid foods. And I want you to pay attention to this. I'll be back on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Well, the show is coming to a conclusion, and I do find uh, the title of my Hachette book coming out in October on the web, Government Zero, the inside story of the progressive Islamic takeover. From best-selling author of Stop the Coming Civil War, it's not available. I'm not selling you a book. And the only book you can buy of mine right now for this summer is The Reading, Countdown in Mecca. But Government Zero is my blockbuster. My, it's the sin qua non. It's my magnus opus. It's that simple. That's the end of the road, no more. After that, it's watercolors and poetry in a white hat. 